why do we act so rudely and sometimes like idiots in bad traffic? What about that five second rule? Can you drop something on the floor and pick it up and eat it and still have it be germ free? These are some of the weighty matters that we're going to discuss today on No Nonsense with an amazing guest, Timothy Caulfield. Uh, he's a scientific myth buster. You might know him from his Netflix series, The User's Guide to Cheating Death. Or maybe you've read a couple of the books, Is Gwyneth Paltrow Wrong About Everything? A look at how science and celebrity really intersect. In a new book, he promises to vaccinate us all against misinformation that's out there, particularly in the science world. It's called Relax, Damn It, A User's Guide to the Age of Anxiety. Timothy Caulfield joins us. Uh, I think you're in Edmonton, aren't you? I'm in Edmonton right now. Yeah, yes. there you are. <laughs> so from Alberta to Saskatchewan. Now, Timothy has a great long list of titles, too. A law professor at the University of Alberta, research director of its Health Law Institute, and a Canada Research Chair in Health Law and Policy. Like, you're a serious guy. What are you doing on Netflix talking about Gwyneth Pal Paltrow? <laughs> well, you know, it's all Trojan horses, to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, I, 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 one of the goals is I, I try to make um, you know, what are actually really serious topics uh, relatable and, and relevant. Yeah. And, and I really hope that, I, you know, I, I, in some small way, uh, I can do that. And, and I try to do that definitely with, with, with the new book, um, because, you know, uh, we are now living in this age of, of misinformation. And, and I think you can make a compelling argument that this is one of the defining issues of our time. And so I, I try to explore, you know, that broad, that, that broad dilemma uh, through a couple of, of unique lenses. Well, it is kind of a misinformation pandemic in that way, or its own uh, demic, because as we've witnessed through the pandemic itself and through the, um, the development of the vaccines and the communications around the vaccines, I mean, this is a bouncing ball. You got to, it changes every five minutes. It's, it's been it's been absolutely incredible. You know, this is a, a, an area that I've studied for a long time and, and I didn't even think it was going to be this bad. You know, we, you know, our team <laughs> were saying it's, it's going to, you know, the pandemic is going to be associated with all this mis misinformation. It's going to be bad to be ready for it. Holy cow. I, you know, I, I had, <laughs> I had no idea it was going to get this bad. And one of the things I, I found uh, amazing is how quickly misinformation became part of the story. Uh, you know, early days, I don't know if you remember, um, Canadians were pretty unified. Um, we were really in this together. And, and it felt like after about a month, it became polarized and the misinformation became, you know, too big a, a part uh, of the story. And of course, now that we're in, in this, this push for, with vaccines, we're, we're seeing it play an even more dominant role. So it is, it is depressing. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of wacky conspiracy theories out there. But then with the mixed messaging from the so-called officials and professionals and politicians and, and you know, epidemiologists, there, there's a lot of conflicting information. There is no truth about it. And that's part of the problem. You know, the, the, the messaging is, uh, I'll put it kindly, <laughs> has, been, <laughs> has been less than ideal. Um, whether you're talking about that is the, so diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're, whether you're talking at, about at the international level, so the World right. Health Organization, um, yeah. whether you're talking about it uh, on the you know national level, the CDC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, whether you're talking about regional public health authorities, uh, provincial health authorities, it really hasn't been ideal. Um, you know, I, I like to believe we're learning and, and trying to get better. And this is, um, I'm hopeful, always glass half full kind of guy. Yeah. But one of the legacies of, of the pandemic is going to be a greater appreciation of how important, how important good science communication is. Good, transparent, trustworthy science communication is. And, and, and I really do hope that's going to be one of the legacies. That was one of my concerns, which is like the whole mask fiasco at the, at the beginning, wear them, don't wear them. They work, they don't work, put them on three-year-olds, put them on 85. You know, it was just crazy. Like a little bit of honesty would have helped, which is we have a shortage of some of this stuff. We're going to concentrate on the health professionals and the rest of you use a scarf. 
Well, you, you know, I, I actually think that the, the mask um, fiasco, let's call it that, yeah. <laughs> is a really good example of, of the challenge of science communication. Because yeah. early days, so let's go 2020, 20 February, January, February, early March. To be honest with you, the science was unclear, right? And yeah. there were scientifically plausible reasons why the CDC, the World Health Organization, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada was not recommending mask use, right? There really were scientifically plausible reasons. You know, people often say, well, it was about shortages and that was part of the story, but yeah. there was also concern. Number one, there was no evidence that it worked. Number two, that possibly was going to result in this complacency where people um, were more likely to transmit the um, the virus and, and also concern that people just did, wouldn't put them on well and, and it would increase the spread. So that was early days. And then so we got this kind of communication, but you're 100 percent right. The, what we should have learned from that is the health authority should have communicated the uncertainty. Right. They should have yep. said, we don't know what the science is exactly. right now. Our recommendation is X, Y and Z. As the science accumulates, we might change. Instead, we got these declarations. Right. The, yep. this, these dogmatic pronouncements. And then they switched. And that's a surefire way to lose trust, right? We should say, we don't know. This is our recommendation now. Then as the body of evidence started to accumulate, and by the way, this is also a really interesting story about what a body of evidence looks like, because it's hard to study mask wearing well, right? And this is exactly. not, it's not easy to create a clinical yeah. trial to study this well. So what you have is this slow accumulation of observational studies of laboratory studies of you know regional variation Anecdotes. studies yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know so you have these uh these studies slowly accumulate and then it becomes crystal clear that masks matter right and you see the you see the the recommendations change right uh so that that's the other part of this story i think it's it's an example of the reality that changing your mind uh, is not a condemnation of science. It's not a condemnation right. of experts. And that's often how it's rolled out right now, right? Well, you know, science doesn't know what's... On the contrary, right? You know, you want yeah. your science-informed public health authorities to change their mind according to the science. That's a badge of honor, not not something to be yeah. ashamed of. Well, that's about true in, in life. You know, I mean, you, you want a politician to change their mind if presented with evidence as opposed to being accused of doing a 180. Like... We should think that changing minds and new positions based on information is a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah, you're right. Isn't, isn't it incredible? And increasingly so. If you change your mind, yeah. <laughs> you know, you were wrong. You were wrong. Yeah. We're seeing that now with the lab leak, right? Yeah. We're seeing that with the Absolutely. lab leak and how it's being framed now. It's like it's a gotcha moment. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's an admission that science is uncertain. That, you know, that's a, a fantastic thing. That's a good thing. Yeah, no, it is a great. Okay, we, we could do this forever, but I want to come back to some of the things in the book. Relax, damn it, because this is um, kind of a user's guide. Your other program is a user's guide to cheating death. This is kind of a user's guide to dealing with all those things. We make a million decisions every day in our life, and we have to kind of get through it. And usually there is some science behind our our behaviors and, and our habits, but they're also greatly shaped by things we read on the internet, Dr. Google, what movie stars say. So it gets kind of um, just making that decision. And, and again, it's been heightened with the pandemic, but each one of those decisions really comes with a reason. There's a basis for it, whether it's shaking hands, hugging, sleep, what you need, how many cups of coffee you have, it's all kind of interwoven. That's right. And, and the gimmick in the book is it takes place <laughs> over a typical day, right? Right. And right. it's it's all the decisions we make throughout the day. And I kind of try to analyze the the science behind each one of those, each one of those decisions. And, and the reason I did that was as you know, as I said at the start, I wanted to make it relatable because yeah. you know, the, these forces that shape our decisions, um, it impacts me, it impacts you, it impacts, you know, your neighbor, it impacts all of us. And um, that's why it's called Relax, Damn It, because it's a little bit, supposed to be a little bit of an ironic title, because, you know, right. I got to right. learn to relax a little bit myself. In the siege of anxiety, <laughs> exactly. So, okay, you know, well, I, I wanted to unpack those things. Let's look at a couple. Um, drinking eight glasses, a hundred glasses of water, whatever it is, that changes to, do, does this matter a whit? No, 
<laughs> you know, I, I, I'm glad you asked about that one because I'm absolutely <laughs> fascinated with the eight glasses of water a day. I know. You know, it, it's been around forever. It's been around forever. Yeah. And it's incredible how sticky it is because, you know, I, you know, I've got to look back at, you know, what, where it came from and how people have talked about this and it's constantly being debunked. You know, it's been, as long as it's been around, <laughs> people have been debunking it, but it's, it's so sticky. And I think it's a number of, a number of reasons it's sticky is because it feels right. It's that it feels yeah. intuitively correct. You know, you know, we need water. Uh, so of course the, you know, more water is good. And then it also plays to that that more is better fallacy, which exists yeah. a lot in the wellness industry, right? So, you know, the right amount of vitamins is good. So then, you know, our crazy amount of vitamins is better, right? You know, yeah. uh, the right amount of water is good. So therefore, you know, crazy amount of water, you know, is better. Uh, the other thing is it's become very closely tied to the wellness industry, right? And we have exactly. to remember, this is a massive, massive industry. You know, wa marketing water itself is a multi-billion dollar industry so you pay four dollars a bottle in the airport i mean it's crazy <laughs> a little bottle <laughs> it, it is crazy and 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 the other thing i, I think is funny and and i you know I, I actually had more on this in the in in the book and my editor chopped it out a little bit but <laughs> it, the degree to which people think that that water is better for you or tastes better that, that's all a myth right it's all a myth yeah. they've actually done blind taste tests with between tap water and yeah. bottled water and people often choose the tap water um uh you know look i think it's really been very very important caveat here there are set parts of the world and parts of canada where we don't have clean drinking water right exactly. and that i think is is really important and if anything um we should be emphasizing that and not you know all of us carrying around stainless steel water <laughs> and drinking it you know yes. like we're about to go out on the sahara desert Yes, and that somehow merges with saving the planet if you put the water that you don't need in an environmentally friendly container, then somehow you're pure and your behavior is exemplary. Yeah, it, it does play it does play to virtue a lot. You know, it's really yes. interesting because a lot of the wellness industry plays on this idea that you're almost morally obligated to do this. You know, if you aren't constantly trying to improve yourself through these yeah. techniques, you're failing somehow, right? You, you know? yeah. and, and the other thing I find fascinating with the wellness industry is it's it's always has this, you know, on the one hand, it tries to market itself in a positive way, you know, all the marketing sunshine and green, and but really it's about fear mongering, right? It's really a very yes. dark story about how we're supposed to be afraid of our world. About It, it is and, fear mongering at its core. That's exactly what it is. If you don't do this, you will be, fatter you will die you will be uglier you you know fill in the blanks like they never say it of course that directly but boy it, it plays to people's um sense of self you're right you know and with with water you know you're yeah. supposed to make your skin more beautiful did you know that did you know that? no yeah. no you know you just pee it out <laughs> and uh and the other thing is you know when you drink you drink when you're thirsty you know thanks evolution yeah. right that's, that's yes uh, your body kind of tells know, you that it, it, yeah and that's the other interesting thing with the wellness industry is it it it, it invites you not to trust your body, right? And it invites you not to trust your own, you know, your own biological needs. You need to do something more that the market tells you to do. The stuff, you know, I know you've got a lot of attention for the, you know, is Gwyneth Paltrow wrong about everything? <laughs> and, and the answer is, yeah, pretty much, I think. Uh, but it is that intersection of celebrity. They are even telling us now about wellness buildings and which buildings they feel comfortable going into, not just which cream they're going to put on their face, which they probably don't anyway. Uh, the well, you know, celebrities have an incredible impact on it. And in fact, we've learned more about this, uh, Senator, since during the pandemic, because there's been yeah. a lot of interesting research on the impact of prominent individuals, which really is celebrities, right? Prominent individuals right. on the spreading of misinformation, um, not just about diet, not just about exercise, not just about beauty, but also about uh, the pandemic. And, yeah. and we can, you can even map the impact. There was a really interesting study from Oxford that found, it was early days in the pandemic, but I, I still think their findings completely hold up and have been sort of replicated by other laboratories. But they found that that about 20%, what they did is they looked at bits of misinformation about the pandemic, and they found that 20% of all that misinformation had as its source a prominent individual, which is pretty high to begin with, right? 20% right. of their. 
But, but here's the really important number. 69% of what we all share on social media is us sharing the message from the prominent individual. So that really yeah. shows how it's a top-down, bottom-up phenomenon driven by celebrity culture. And if it's wrong, we're all in trouble. Yeah. And if it's wrong and, and, and this, they were looking at just that misinformation, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it, it was wrong. And we're seeing that around, of course, vaccines, but a lot of, a lot of other things like hydroxychloroquine is a really good example, right? right? Um, uh, that was largely driven by, by prominent individuals. That narrative was created and driven by, by prominent individuals. But then, and you mentioned er earlier, then we've got the lab leak theory and, and, you know, people are going to now seriously investigate this because we should, uh, and, and we need to know that. So that's part of the problem too, which is what was misinformation or, um, you know, seen as a, a conspiracy theory or a, a crank theory might have actually a lot of truth to it or some truth to it. And then what does that do when you witness that process? Well, you know, this is a, I, I, I find, I just wrote a piece on this. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And so I think this, it is, it is fascinating because we have to remember that despite the, the current, the current portrayal of the lab leak um, theory, which is that it is possible. We have to remember it's still just a theory. And mm -hmm. the, most of the evidence tells us it's probably of a natural cause, right? It's probably did come from an animal. That's what most of the evidence says. And we may never, we may never Actually know, know. Right, where, where it came from. But the danger I think is when this, ed, this recognition of uncertainty is held up as a, um, a validation of the conspiracy theories. And the example I use in the piece I just wrote is, you know, if if you have a, a, a world renowned meteorologist that that looks at the temperature and right. barometric pressure and computer modeling and tells us that um, it's going to rain tomorrow, um, uh, 95 percent chance it's going to rain tomorrow. And then you have a, uh, a weather conspiracy theorist who thinks that <laughs> that rain is a made by big weather to keep us all inside to work. Uh, and there's a YouTube expert who who's sharing this. They say it's going to be sunny tomorrow. It turns out to be sunny. That doesn't make the conspiracy right. theorists the best way to make information. We should still we should still use science to inform our public health and you know our decisions. Well, and and the flip side of that is also the ad hominem attack because you know if you then say. I, I don't like President Trump or President Trump is an idiot or I don't like President Biden or, you know, all of that, then that somehow um, that, that that's a legitimate way to dismiss the information. Yeah. Oh, you're right. You're right. And, and that's one of the fascinating things um, that has happened is so many of our decisions now, big and small, have sort of an ideological valence to them. Yeah. And so, for example, we are we did a study on on how hydroxychloroquine was is portrayed on the debate was portrayed on mm -hmm. on on Twitter. Now, this this is out for peer review. It still hasn't been. So I'm, I'm giving you unpeer reviewed okay. <laughs> impression from our okay. data. That's the caveat. Everybody. <laughs> That's yeah. my caveat. But yeah. what but what we found was exactly what you just described, that this is, is really a story of ideology, right? So we yeah. found that almost all of the discussion about hydro hydroxychloroquine wasn't really about the science. It really was about ideological flags, right? You know, this is my yeah. ideological camp. So therefore hydroxychloroquine works or therefore it doesn't work. And that becomes, that's really, really problematic on a number of levels because it becomes very difficult then to, to change people's minds. Once it becomes part of your ideology, your personal ideological brand, right. it's pretty hard to, to change your mind. Or if saying that, that there might've been issues at the lab in Wuhan becomes a racist act as opposed yes. to trying to clarify facts science right that yeah uh you're right and uh, we're seeing that happen already you know we're seeing that yeah. kind of language happen already maybe you know the ra racialized language is being used in, in the in the context right. of the of the lab leak uh and, and also people are trying to use that language to say that trump was right you know as again i'll use my you know my, yeah, my weather example that's not yeah. the case at all Right. That's not the yeah. case at all. And I think it's also important to recognize that this could take, you know, 10 or 15 years if we find out and we may never find out.
Some of the things, it's interesting what you said about the water. Some of the other habits that you say that have underlying um, science to them. I mean, we, we learned that washing hands actually does matter. No yeah. cases of flu, <laughs> sickness way down. All the things your mother told you when you were a kid, you know? It, it, you're you're so right. You know the hand washing thing is is hilarious. I'm I'm fascinated to see how this. Uh, I'm I'm watching this space. <laughs> yes, know? yes, because yes. <laughs> there has been. Uh, this is not going to surprise you at all. You know, I've been following this throughout the pandemic. Uh, the people washing their hands, people saying, yeah, saying they're washing their hands. You know, went up way in, right. incredibly during the pandemic. I can't remember the exact data, but we'll say over ninety percent. Yeah. And then that this is just people saying they're washing their hands properly. It started to deteriorate. Now we're almost back to where we were pre-pandemic, right? So that's that's grim in itself, right? Be, given yeah. the data on washing your hands, it's one of those very basic things that we can do that really does make a public health health difference for yourself but also for your community. But then when you look at it objectively, so they do these studies where they, you know, they video the people washing their hands or there's sort of an electronic sensor of people washing their hands. Almost nobody washes their hands properly. The, da the data is so grim. And we're talking about people in hospitals, Senator. Yes. We're not talking about... As, as we know, because of the <laughs> hospital infections. It's true. So and uh, it'll be very, very interesting to see if all of the discussion, you know, I, you know, uh, hand washing got a lot of attention, which I love yeah. uh, over the pandemic. We'll see if it, if, if it sticks. Do you think people are going to start shaking hands again? That's the other thing I'm watching. I, I, think, yeah, I think it's going to be the I fist bump. I actually, no, I actually think people, well, it also depends on the part of the country that you're in too, right? I mean, yes, I think that's different. I think urban populations react differently than rural, would you say? I, I agree with you. And and as yeah. you know from the book, I'm not a touchy person. <laughs> so, yeah. I, you know, I hug my cats and my wife and that's about it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so you I'm sort of like your... for the fist bump. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that, I mean, I've even noticed in Saskatchewan, of course, we've opened up and there's been a couple of social situations where people say, I can finally give you a hug. And then they do. But they had to be that kind of person before. We're not going to make huggers out of, you know, germaphobes. Yeah, people like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, there was a lot of interesting uh, research and it's hard to study this well. So you got to be careful not to overinterpret these kinds of studies. But right. talking about how how much people missed you know, t hugging yeah. and, and, and there's some, you know, I talk about it in the book a little bit. There is some evidence, again, hard to study it well, that it matters, you know, touching humans matter, you know, yeah. we want to be close and, and it really can have a beneficial, a beneficial impact. So for, it'll be very interesting to see how this, this plays out, you know, what, the, well, how the social norms have been changed. And you were talking about fear. I mean, we, we even went through that phase where your pets were going to be able to transmit you know, COVID. So maybe you shouldn't be hugging your pet or, you know, yeah. it, like we really rode the roller coaster in a big way here. Remember the groceries? You know, there was that yes. famous video of you know, yeah. cleaning, you know, and I get it. It was a very scary, it was a very yeah. scary time. But but with respect to misinformation, you know, um, we know that that kind of fear can be leveraged to spread misinformation. And that's exactly what happened. And we saw it in many, many examples of that. Yeah. And everybody was going home washing their canned soup. <laughs> that's right um, putting it in the cold or something like that yeah but you know i think some of the habits will stay i don't know just personally i you know i spend a lot of time on airplanes i'm probably going to wear a mask for a while um you know not in that intense way which is we're all sitting huddled so nobody gets close to you but you know even just for the the onboarding process where you've got lots of people you know, in close quarters, there'll be things that stick in your head for a while. Eh? I, I think so too. And I, you know, like you, I, I used to travel, you know, a couple times a week and, yeah. uh, and so um, I, I think it, I, I agree with you. I think we're going to see more masks in those kind of situations, more people sanitizing, more washing yeah. their, you know, their environment a little bit more. And may, you know, maybe that's, that's a good thing as you know, in many cultures that, that, that was, you know, relatively standard for a, a significant yeah. portion of the population. Yeah. Uh, some of the other things that you um, talk about that are, I mean, kind of off this topic, but the parking issue that we're somehow, yeah. Honestly, and I know this is my own behavior too. We're hardwired to be irritated by some sense of, you know, the moral code of what how people <laughs> should act in traffic. And you shouldn't be in front of me and slam on your brakes. Otherwise, you're a horrible human being if you do that. 
honestly, what's wrong with us? What's going on in our head? You know, Senator, it's funny because uh, I was surprised by how much that section of the book resonated with people. Yeah. <laughs> you know? it's and, I, and I give I give public lectures and on it. And that's <laughs> the, the thing that they remember. There is yeah. this actual body of evidence and some actually really good evidence about how much people hate parking, how much park parking stresses them up. And yeah. exactly what yeah. what you said, we judge other people, right? You know, we're oh, yeah. we're the good parker. <laughs> You're the bad parker. So uh, I find that fascinating. Another thing I find fascinating is how everyone thinks it, this goes to one of our cognitive biases, right? We all think we're we're better than we really are. We all think that we're a good parker. You're right. the bad parker. I'm the parking expert. <laughs> you know, yes. Kind of and so they, I always tell people, no, you're not a parking savant, you know. And the <laughs> other thing that's interesting <laughs> is what you should always do is take the first park. There's actual mathematical modeling on this. Right. Take the first parking spot. I would say park the damn car. <laughs> park. Not drive around the block no. <laughs> 25 times. <laughs> park the damn car. And if you do that over time, it's almost always the right decision. One more little uh, interesting yeah. stat. This was a study that came from the UK and it's not in the book. Um, uh, women are better at parking than men. And of course uh, we are. Of course you needed you are. <laughs> a study to know that. Yeah. And, and it's funny because you, you th this is not going to surprise you. Men think they're better and women only, I think it's only 15% of women think they're better than men. Yeah. You know, there's so much going on in that data, right? But they studied, they looked at thousands of parking moments and women were better at everything, everything <laughs> <laughs> than men. I, I, I love that stat. You mean asking for directions, things like that, which <laughs> men seem, you know, genetically, well, they just can't, they just can't do it. The other thing that troubled me is when, and you talked about this in the book, that when you pull up into a parking, you know, somebody's, somebody's in their car and they're leaving. And so you're parking behind to wait for that space, right? And you're trying to fend off the guy that's coming from the other direction. The person in the car who's leaving actually takes longer they actually delay it <laughs> somehow just to you know annoy you yeah i i i i it's fascinating these little things that we do <laughs> like these little moments in our yep. our humanity <laughs> that, that sort yes just that sort of uncover our our inner turmoil let's put it that way yeah I, isn't it incredible that it's it's like you're trying to make this point to the person behind you that you know i know you're there yeah. um yeah, so in the book, I always try to remind people to be kind of gracious about parking, you know, and remind right. this person's a bad parker, you're a bad parker, they're a bad parker. Let's, yeah. let's, let's get through this together. There's these well, little moments throughout the day, right, that kind of reveal these big truisms. Yeah, and I mean, we need to, we're going to have to practice re-entry into civil society here again, because we haven't been out interacting in the same way. And the driving did get really nuts during COVID, it seemed, you know, once people went out of their house, it was just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm going where I need to go and you get the hell out of my way. Like, I don't know what that was about, but it seemed to happen everywhere. Well, I'm starting to travel again soon yeah. this month. And um, I always have to remind myself to be Zen. <laughs> you know, this is where, yeah. this is where I lose my humanity. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm, no. You know, when you're everyone standing up when they shouldn't stand up and you yep. know, I'm sure you experience it all the time. We're trying to get the plane off the ground. Will you please yeah. sit down and put the bag under your seat? Yeah. yeah no, we no. all want to get it off the plane. We all want to get <laughs> on the plane. Like, I don't know what you think I'm doing. So I'm, I'm going to try to exercise that kind yeah. of Zen uh, in those moments. Yeah. I've got, I've got, I've made that, um, you know, new year's resolution about a thousand times, but I think this is a good, <laughs> page turner event i want to ask about a couple of other things um that that you touch on in the book and the, it's the email issue the number you use is 270 billion emails are sent every day i don't know how exponentially that rises a third of our time really um you know we use in a work day or and now that that melds with home when people are working at home this is kind of scary it, it's terrifying and and so the senator the do the the way i selected the topics for my book was it was it was a mix between things i've heard from the public when i'm doing public lectures right. or on a, uh, things i knew that people were interested in, but also stuff that was relevant to me because right. email 
consumes my life, right? It yeah. absolutely consumes a lot. So as I say in the book, like the numbers are staggering. When you go to a major city and, and you see a crowd, I this is a paraphrasing something I have in the book, you're basically yeah. looking at a crowd of email answerers. You know, this is what humans do. It's stunning, right? It's absolutely yeah. stunning uh, how, how much it eats away uh, at our time. And, and so we really, I, I think if you can figure out a way to manage your, your email for most people, not everyone have the same kind of jobs, but for most people, you can make a tangible difference in their day. It's just, it's an awful lot of time, but you also talk about this other phenomenon. I don't know, fubbing, is that what you call it? The, the pH is an F <laughs> yeah. in that fubbing, which is, and this is based on a study in India that you know, this is about people who in the company of, of other people, like right now, if I was picking up my phone and checking my email and, you know, that's the signal to the other person, you've lost my interest, you're, you're boring. We do it all the time at the supper table sitting, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. Sorry, I missed most of that. I was checking yeah, something. Exactly. <laughs> sorry, uh, what was that? <laughs> but, exactly. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, so I think that there's two sides to this story. Yeah. So there's actually a lot of research on just having a phone near you has an adverse impact on social interaction, right? Because a phone is more than, it's this portal into another part of your life, right? It's a portal yeah. into your work. You're carrying your work with you in your po pocket. So just having it around can increase increase your stress level. So uh, and I and I think that it is so incredibly annoying when when someone. I, I, how many times have you had a conversation where someone's actually answering a text while they're talking to you? Yeah. And then you go, can you? And they'll say, Oh, I'm listening. No, you're not. <laughs> I can see. Your yeah, you're moving. absolutely not. Yeah, <laughs> you're. But, but I, I also think that we're starting to see a slow shift in the social norms where that's becoming more acceptable, you know, where, yeah. you know, when my kids do it, um, I, I think is that cohort of individuals, are they going to be more okay with fubbing behavior with, you know, people having their phones constantly out? And I think, I think the answer, I think the answer is yes. And so that's going to have a really interesting impact on human interaction. Well, we justify it by calling it multitasking right? We're so busy and we're so important uh, and we're so smart that we can do all these three things uh, at once because, and that somehow has virtue. I'm not sure it does. Uh, a, it doesn't have virtue and B, you're terrible at multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, there, there have actually been studies on this and, and everyone is terrible. I think it's like this, uh, I don't even know how they, they quantify this, but 97.5% of people are bad at multitasking. It, yeah. it, creates a cognitive drain. It, it makes you more inefficient. It has an adverse impact on your creativity. It's just, you can't, you can't do it. But what's also interesting is seven, one study found that 70% of people think they're good at, at multitasking, yeah. right? And, and there really aren't, right? So you, you're right. And the other thing that's interesting about multitasking is it's held up as a, a virtuous or, yeah, uh, that's quality. like, oh, I'm good at multitasking. Yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah. It's not good for you. And it's not good for the people around you. You get that on P on job applications. People, that's what I'm saying. They promote themselves as multitaskers when in many cases, everybody's getting, you know, a mediocre uh, response because you're doing three things at once and it's rude. Um, the other thing is about the phone. And I found this interesting that it doesn't make you just feel connected, you know, when you're walking around the phone with your phone. And that's sometimes a safety issue. That's a good thing if you're, walking alone to have your phone on, but it somehow makes you feel included even when you're not. There is some world you're attached to, but it may not be real. Yeah, it, it is. It is interesting, right? And and whenever we talk about technology, we have to be careful not to be, you know, technophobes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know, because, you know, we all, we've critiqued every technology from the radio to, you know, movies right. to, you know, but, but you're right. Uh, there is this uh, really interesting research and in I'm going to use this caveat again, hard to study this well, yeah. uh, that, that people feel connected to the, you know, so you go to a party, you see this happening where people will be standing alone, looking at their phone. Right. Yeah. And uh, before they would have just been standing alone, maybe with a little plate of, plate of food. right? <laughs> yeah. So I think they yeah. feel, people feel less, less alone. So maybe that's a little bit of a good thing, right? A little bit of a good thing, but that also speaks to the power of the phone to take us away from where we are, right? It's, it's yeah. 
taking us away from the moment and, and putting us some, someplace else. And that's one of the reasons that phones and commu computers, computers in general are so much more, it's not just this idea that you know, you, you're being distracted by the information on your phone. It really is this portal to a different world, to, to, your, to your stress, to your, your calendar, to your responsibilities, and, and to all your social media feeds that just create this chaotic information environment. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot going on there. And I, and I do think simple steps like you know, trying to put your phone down in, in yeah. a way, I, I try to do that. <laughs> you know, I, try to walk the walk, you know, so I try, yeah, I, I yeah. have a colleague that, that actually puts her phone in a little bed at night and puts a blanket <laughs> over it and tucks it in. <laughs> okay. And that's got like a whole other issue. Moment. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, I mean, it's ironic in a way that if you're standing at the party with the phone, I mean, presumably you're at the party to interact with people. So maybe you're looking at your calendar before you walk over and ask the person whether they want to have lunch but the flip side is you've also distanced people because you've put that phone between you and anybody who might come and approach you because you look busy. You're right. And um, I might, you know, confession time, I'll do that on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. when I'm, no, no, I know. <laughs> you know. I will actually, actually do that. You're at an airport or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have this, um, this scene in my book um, where I talk about the fa our family dinners. We, uh, I'm yeah. very fortunate that I've had this oper this career where I've been able to travel the world, you know, visiting professor different places. And they, Senator, they really are the most magical moments in my life. I joke that if an alien came down, they were going to erase my memory. These would be the one memories I'd ask to keep because we can't afford, you know, the, 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 our phones are too expensive to use. So mm -hmm. none of us have our phones out. We're sitting at a dinner table um, and, and we're interacting in this incredibly yeah. meaningful way over hours sometimes. And I, I fear that I feel fear that those moments are being taken from us. Yeah, I, that is uh, Graham Kerr, you know, who is the um, chef and the galloping gourmet. He was I remember doing an interview with him years ago. And even then he said the dinner table was the last great gathering spot and we were risking it with with the technology um i i agree with them and, and you know the wonderful thing is i have four kids so my my sample yeah. size is pretty big <laughs> uh, they would all agree with me you know yeah. they also and so this is the demographic you know they're they're young adults right this is a demographic that has been the most impacted by the technology yeah. and they still all agree and i know there are other people who agree that that this they love those moments they love the moments yeah. And um, so I think we need to, as I argue in the book, you know, do our best to, to create those, those spaces in our life. Speaking of kids, that one of the stories I really enjoyed was the five second world chocolate cake story, which I'm going to get you to tell, because I still practice this. I still believe in the five second rule. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's a myth, right? It's it's largely a myth. And by the way, I can I can see the house that that happened. <laughs> okay, so the tell story, people the story. Yeah, the story is um, um, our neighbors who who I adore. Uh, we adore them. They're good friends of ours. They incredibly. I'm sure you have friends like this. We are not the clean family. <laughs> we are the unorganized, kerfuffly right. family, and and they're the organized family. And their kids always look. So we 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 took our. Uh, someone was having a birthday and we took my my wife's incredible cake over and as soon as we walked in the door the the cake exploded on the floor and her kids stood perfectly over the the chocolate mess and my kids died <laughs> the chocolate and started consuming it and i think they did that because of the five second rule they knew that we'd say you yeah. got five seconds and then yeah <laughs> the and then we had to clean this mess in. <laughs> and were and were your neighbors horrified or they were pretty horrified. <laughs> they were pretty, they're there's they're lovely, lovely individuals. Um, but uh yeah, the, the data on the five second rules, they've actually studied, they actually have done studies on this, and it, the data is not gonna surprise anyone that of course it matters what kind of food it is, right? Of course yes, it matters what yes. kind of floor it is, you know, all those things matter. Yeah, there's yeah, no yeah. mat, you know. I, I joke in the book, you know, bacteria can't count. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So, you know, it either is or it isn't bacteria. Yeah, no, no, exactly. <laughs> you have um, become, and, and I, I love these old stories, but I want to be a little bit more serious for a moment here, that you actually take myth-busting or debunking and saying, 
it's it's a responsibility for not just guys like you who happen to have a background in law and health, but for everybody to debunk stuff that they uh, know to be false and to actively do that, to engage because of the discussion we were having earlier, which is if you're sending out emails from people or retweeting something that is wrong, uh, you need to do it with something that is right uh, to be part of that process, that we all have to become debunkers. I, I really believe that. I passionately believe that, um, you know, especially for individuals that are are scholars, that are experts, you know, especially if they're publicly funded academics. I, I, I think right. it's it's part of their responsibility to engage engage the community. I was very fortunate to be the lead author on a on a piece for the Royal Society of of Canada on science communication, and that's one of the recommendations that we make. We say that there is this this obligation at, at the very minimum to get on to a public space and correct misinformation about your work, and and perhaps that obligation is even broader. And, and we're and we're seeing entities like the World Health Organization, the CDC, the American Medical Association, right. uh, all these professional organizations kind of embrace this idea that there is this responsibility to be, become part of the public uh, discussion and to correct misinformation when you see it. And number one, it works. It may not feel like it works, but it really does work, especially if that that debunk is done well and in a, in a compassionate way, in a way that can be that can be shared, a way that's in, you know whether it's humor, um, whether uh -huh. it's a story, whether it's art, um, all of those things can make can make a difference. And and the good news, Senator, is and again I talked about the the legacy of the pandemic. I think I'm hopeful that one of the legacies of the pandemic is that we're going to see more and more scientists, clinicians, academics, policymakers do exactly this because there has been this wonderful, amazing, encouraging community grow in Canada over over the past year and a half, two years that, you know, doing exactly that. They're getting on TikTok, you know, they're getting right. on Instagram, they're getting on on Twitter and, and they are um, debunking and debunking in a very positive way. It's not about um, you know, trying to have a nasty debates and, and confrontations on social media. It's about trying to celebrate the science and debunking stuff in a way that is constructive. So what's the, what's the approach? Do you retweet the tweet that you disagree with, or do you just put it out separately so that you're not continuing to spread that information that you think is false? So that, that's a great question. And, and, and because a lot of people are concerned about something that's called the backfire effect, right? So they, yeah. you've probably heard this. And, you know, it's interesting because a lot of journalists still believe this, right? The yeah. idea that, you know, you shouldn't debunk something because then you're just amplifying it and you're just going to get people to become more entrenched in their views. Since about 2010, where, the, where, the, where there, uh, you had this initial research on, on the backfire effect, it's actually been found that it's it's quite rare. Most of, most of the literature has either found no backfire effect or that it's very context specific. Bottom line is we shouldn't let the backfire effect scare us away. Having said that, you know, that I yeah. still think there are uh, appropriate ways to debunk. So when I'm debunking something, uh, I always just take a screenshot because I never want, I never want people to have to link back to the misinformation. Okay. Yeah. And I make it very clear. And sometimes yeah. I write, no, 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 no. Or I'll put some joke across the screenshot to make it yeah. very clear that this is not, so they can't share it going forward. Uh, but in addition to that, I always try to, and this is rule number one of debunking, make, always remember this, the general public is, is your audience, not the hardcore deniers. So if you see something uh, that's misinformation. Don't think you have to, you know, attack that individual or, or counter that individual. Use it as an opportunity to talk about what the science actually says in a really pro pro social constructive manner. And that's what you know. I try to do that. I don't always follow the rules. <laughs> yeah, I, I get pulled into the vortex of a debate sometimes, and I always regret it. Uh, but there are definitely ways that you can debunk that are more successful than than other ways. Well, and the other thing about that is kind of full circle to where we started, which is so much of the debate, certainly surrounding the pandemic, was ideological or that became, um, you know, the symbols for both sides. So in the debunking process, um, you know, trying to keep that clean and not ad hominem or ideological is really difficult. It is difficult. And, and I failed this morning. <laughs> what did <laughs> you Twitter. do? <laughs> <laughs> Twitter. What did you I, do? You know, I, I'm getting very frustrated with 
Um, it could, there, look, there's a body of evidence that, that shows that people that are uh, lean, ideologically right, uh, are more likely to be vaccination hesitant. And we've seen that both in Canada and the United States, much worse than the United States, in the UK also, we're seeing in other jurisdictions. And there's a pretty robust body of evidence to back that up now. Um, so being vaccination hesitant is increasingly becoming sort of an ideological flag, especially for Republicans in the United States. But you're seeing a little bit of that in, in Canada. Because too. they coach it in terms of freedom and individual exactly. rights. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and um, you know, this morning I, you know, I ranted against, I can't remember, I think I called it the, uh, the, the, the death cult of uh, dark age. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you really Not the off. best way to start a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone can trip up. You know, I think the, the, the goal is to, you know, in general, globally, try to keep it a positive conversation. Everyone gets frustrated. I understand that. Yeah, that's that. I think we are in a in a a place now, particularly as we go forward from this crisis that we've all been through, is that we have to try and tone that stuff down. It's just become really far too politicized on both sides to be helpful. You're right, and I'm involved in this uh, entity called Science Up First, which actually started yeah. with uh, Senator Stan Kutcher. Um, yeah. And it's it's an initiative. Now I'm just an advisor. It has this fantastic team that that's running it. Um, but but what it's basically a social media pro, uh, uh, yeah. um, initiative to fight misinformation. Yep. And we we made as one of our core values exactly what you just described. That's the core value. We're not going to be confrontational. We're not going to be negative. We're going to try to be positive. We're going to have diverse voices from every community being part of this conversation. And and I, I really think that. Sometimes it feels like it's slower and it's more difficult to do it that way because confrontational often equals clicks, right? Um, yeah. But I think long-term, long-term, it matters. It's so good to talk to you. This is really interesting stuff. So I'm going to get back to you in about six months. We're going to do hand-washing, hand-shaking, <laughs> see what's changed. You'll be out there. I think one thing that's going to change is people don't want, I mean, I'm speaking personally, except I've talked to a lot of people who've Nobody wants to go to big dinners and events like that. I mean, COVID has given us an excuse to stay at home and stay closer to the people that really matter, not the big rooms full of strangers. We'll see if that holds as well. It will be interesting to see what happens with, with concerts, with, with events. Yeah. Uh, I have two big events this fall, uh, yeah. both in the United States. So I'm fascinated to see how they play out. Yeah, I, I'm going to New York for the, it's the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and it'll be interesting to see, you know, whether we can even cross by then and how and, you know. I'll be watching that same day, I'll think of you, I'll be sitting in the Notre Dame football stadium with 90,000 other fans. Um, <laughs> go, that's where my daughter is. My daughter's at, oh, at Notre okay, Dame. Okay. <laughs> so go Irish. <laughs> but it's the same weekend. It's the same weekend. Yeah. So I'll think yeah. of you. You'll be in a crowd. I will be too. All right. Thanks so much again, Timothy. We'll talk soon again, I hope. Timothy Caulfield, the, the latest book is Relax, Damn It, but you'll find a lot of stuff out there and his Netflix program. But he does have all the academic credentials, and it's important that we do that. that if you're going to myth bust, you better have some uh, info and science on your side. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed Okay. It. Talk to you soon. <laughs>